Mastering is the final stage of production when you're making a recording. The last chance to listen, tweak, double check to make sure there's no problems, and make any final adjustments to the completed mix before sending it out into the world. But past that general description, the technical specifics of what goes on in the mastering suite have always been a little mysterious to the average engineer or recordist. Exactly what processing to apply, and more importantly, when and how much to apply, are part of the so-called black art of mastering, which for years was always left to dedicated mastering engineers in their specialized studios full of pricey high-end equipment that was often kind of unfamiliar to most tracking and mixing engineers. But with the advent of software-based mastering tools, the art of mastering was brought to the masses, for better and worse. Better, because now anyone could own the tools they'd need to handle that final stage of preparation to get their projects ready for distribution, by whatever means. But also, worse, because applying powerful mastering processors to a full mix can just as easily have a negative impact on the mix as a positive one, especially if used with too much of a heavy hand. And the ready availability of these relatively low-cost processors, as opposed to the really pricey gear employed in mastering suites in the pre-digital era, doesn't factor in the even more important aspects of what a dedicated mastering engineer brings to the job. One of those factors is his experience in listening for the more subtle aspects of a mix that might need to be addressed, and applying processing sparingly, often doing as little as possible, just what's absolutely needed to serve the music. A professional mastering studio is also an acoustically calibrated and treated room with a set of calibrated monitors that provides a listening reference that can be trusted. A lot of mix rooms, especially smaller, untreated project and home studio environments, they work fine for tracking and even for the broader strokes of mixing, but for the very small, very subtle adjustments to the mix that a good mastering guy will be making, mixing rooms may call the sound enough that they'll fail to provide a neutral enough reference for those tweaks to translate properly when others play the song in other environments. And that's a big part of what mastering is about, making sure the song will travel well, sound good anywhere. And finally, when a dedicated mastering engineer is handed a song or album, he's bringing fresh ears to the music. No matter how good or even how experienced the engineer who did the mixes might be, he can't hear it fresh the way the listening public will. He's heard it so many times, he's gotten used to all the little quirks on the tracks and is likely to subconsciously gloss over some subtle issues that should be addressed in mastering. Fresh ears, at least those experienced in listening for detail, will be more likely to pick up on those small issues and maybe even hear a few areas where something could be improved on a bit. Just because they're able to react to hearing the mix for the first time, things that are flying under the radar of everyone who's heard the tracks a thousand times will jump out clearly and subtle tweaks can be made that enhance that initial impression that listeners will get when they hear those songs for the first time. Now, it may sound like I'm making an argument here to always take a project to a professional mastering house, and that is a good idea, if possible. But in many cases, it's not an option. Budget constraints, time constraints, availability, all these are good reasons why artists, mixing engineers, and even home recordists may need to complete that final production stage themselves so the recordings will stand up, technically, to any other recordings out there. Nobody wants to have listeners distracted from the music because the recording is too soft, or too loud, or too muddy, or too thin, or the image is imbalanced, or the vocal's not clear enough, or any of the other technical flaws that can distract a listener from the music on that critical first listen when most people decide if they like a song and will want to hear it again. So that's what this course is for. We can't put everyone into a calibrated mastering studio or endow them with the years of experience and critical listening skills that those guys may have. But we can provide some guidance for applying mastering inside the box with the tools that we all have available nowadays in our DAWs and third-party plugins. The course will touch a little on the evolution of mastering and cover the technical concepts and terminology, like sampler rate and bit resolution, background knowledge that's necessary for the technical aspects of mastering. There'll be a brief overview of some of the tools available, and I'll also cover pre-mastering, what should be done to a finished mix to prep it for that final stage. I'll go over strategies for organizing an in-the-box mastering session, including issues like mastering a collection of songs, like for an album, and using commercial reference tracks to help get a handle on how your master tracks will sound when they get out into the world. And then, of course, I'll spend the most time going over the various tools that are used in mastering. EQ, compression, including multiband compression, and limiting, 
specifically the specialized brick wall limiters that are what's used to get recordings so loud these days. I will touch on the loudness wars, one of the big issues facing anyone who tries their hand at mastering, especially for a client. I'll even go over mastering applications for MS, mid-side processing. Of course, I'll finish up with a look at the very last stages of a mastering session, final safety checks and bouncing down, including a little on the various file formats out there. I'll even touch very briefly on the embedding of metadata in the finished audio files, the data that's used to track sales for commercial disks and downloads. So while this course won't make you into a seasoned mastering specialist overnight, you'll still have to train your ears and your hands to get used to the more subtle listening and tweaking you need for effective mastering. You should come away with a solid understanding of the tools, the issues, and the process of mastering, and that should put you well on your way to making better masters. So let's get started.